Knoxville Game Design September 2019 Creating Games in Small Talk with Dylan and Levi. Welcome everyone to Knoxville Game Design for September 2019. This is a monthly discussion of our game projects and topics in the games industry. My name is Levi Smith. I'm in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. You may know some of my games, Kitty's Adventure and TTY GFX Adventure. Also, this month we have Dylan Wolf and Lenore City, and some of his games are Retro Future and Shifty Shapes. Hi. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of news here. Let's see if I can minimize uh oh f11 okay <laughs> okay first of all i got a notification that uh a new version of unreal engine has oh i need to share out do, 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 do. share screen screen one share okay so there's a new version of unreal engine out i know we've had a couple of people pop in that, who have said that they're unreal developers uh, this is Unreal 4.23, so it looks like they got a new physics engine. I haven't played around with this yet. Um, one interesting thing is this new fracturing uh, built-in that they have. And this looks like, a lot like the Blender cell fracture that I use, but I guess they just have it built in to Unreal Engine now. So this looks like this would be kind of fun to play with. I guess this is good for, I'm, I'm assuming, if you want to break up a mash like you're blowing up a building or something. I, I'm, I'm assuming that's what this is doing right here. Um, I'm not sure what the connection graph is. Um, they're improving ray tracing, which I really don't use. Maybe it's working behind the scenes. Uh, virtual texting, and they have videos for all this, so if anybody wants to go out and check out what all the new stuff in Unreal Engine is, there's, they've got a lot of videos on here. Uh, new analytics, or this might just be showing like uh, processes and things running within Unreal, and new HoloLens support. So, looks like good stuff there. Uh, the next bit of news is Ludum Dare 45 is coming up. So, we're going to have a kickoff meeting uh, Friday, October 4th, uh, and this is going to be a, uh, three hour early start and three hour early ending time. So get your games in at 6 PM Eastern time. Uh, yeah, Dylan told me about this real world gathering, uh, posting right here. So you can go to the Ludum Dare website, ldjam.com. And I put an entry here for Knoxville, Tennessee. So it looks like they got, <laughs> Detroit, New York, Knoxville, Tennessee, Novosibirsk, Russia, and Lexington, Kentucky, our friends in Lexington. Uh, so you can go find out more information about all the real world game jam sites. So again, uh, we get together uh, for the kickoff and we discuss the topic, uh, the theme for the jam. We don't have like a place where we get together or we get together at Panera Bread, but we don't have a location where we develop games together or anything like that. Uh, but we will discuss our games on the next monthly podcast, which will be the following Sunday. So yeah, yeah, come out and join us. We'll be at Panera Bread North Peters Road on Friday, October 6th. And if you want to learn more about Ludum Dare, you can either go to the, their, their website or you can come talk with us and we'll be glad to... Uh, to share some of our wisdoms about past game jams. Uh, Dylan, I saw that you've been writing a few articles that you've posted on your website. Uh, yeah. I was going to show that off about running a game jam. Um, uh, no, not a game more, jam. This is for uh, uh, the, the conventions, right? Yeah. So um, the convention that I was running, board gaming's, uh, the board gaming room for, uh, which is Hamacon, uh, shut down. Um, like this was, it was planned basically. Um, some of the people involved were kind of getting burnt out. Is Hamacon, was that the one in Nashville? No, that was the one in Huntsville. Huntsville. Alabama. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and so basically I'd been doing this for like four or five years and I just went through and wrote a series of articles on what I had learned and kind of the 
mainly like how how my assumptions didn't necessarily match up with my expectations. Um, it looks like a good lessons learned if you're setting up a board gaming event. Is like what you need to bring and how to set it up and and just the tips like that. Yeah, yeah. Like the the early ones are, are kind of like here's the stuff I pack. Here's the 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 stuff I do. And the later ones are kind of like, what kind of games do you want to put on the schedule? And, you know, kind of how do you get a feel for, for what people are into? Yeah, I remember, like, helping out with a, uh, like, a fighting game tournament. I think it was Pelican here in Knoxville years ago in 2012. Yeah. And, like, one problem we had, and even with the, the like, the what was the one that we did at CreepyCon, the Knoxville Gaming Convention, uh, yeah. it's like, label your stuff, because it's like, well... You know your stuff at home, but when you start getting stuff in- intermingled and everything, it's like, oh. But I guess with board games, I mean, it can be kind of hard because you're not going to label every piece and everything. No, and, and honestly, the labeling isn't the stuff I have the problem with. Mm-hmm. It's um, It's stuff like, you know, make sure you have... Well, like I use a lot of wet erase stuff so that we can change signs or so that I can use um, RPG materials over and over between events. Um, you know, bring trash bags, bring plastic bags, bring extra dice and counters. Like the stuff you wouldn't think of. Kind of like you're saying with, um, you know, label everything. Because until you do it, you you may not think about that. Yeah, I remember at the Knoxville Gaming Convention, it's like, oh, having duct tape and scissors <laughs> is very beneficial. Because yeah. and and if you uh, and you may have other people like asking you for duct tape or spare screwdrivers, like you never do know. I mean, I, I never thought I would need a screwdriver, but for whatever reason, we needed. Oh, it was when I brought the uh, new television in. It didn't have the legs for the monitor, yeah. so I was like, I didn't know I was going to need a screwdriver to screw in legs for a monitor. Yeah, and, and stuff like that was kind of helpful to know. Um, the other thing, just like you brought up CreepyCon, I think a lot of it is you go into one of these events assuming that these are the type of games people will check out. You know, These are the type of games you want to put on your schedule. Or you know, if you're talking about video games, these are the type of games people will want to demo. These are the, the type of like gamers that will play. And when you actually get into it, things don't necessarily match your expectations and there's uh, there's kind of a um, like you kind of have to adjust yeah because that's all that uh, you were doing uh, oh and that's one thing I forgot to mention about the Ludum Dari kickoff is we're gonna have Japanese gaming as well uh, I'm gonna bring a Hanavuda set and also my Mahjong set which I'm still learning how to play Mahjong. I'm getting pretty good at Koei Koei, so I'm actually really excited to play Koei Koei with a real person. And I think you, yeah. have, you have a set too, Dylan, right? Yeah, I can bring that stuff. I have played, I think I played, they added Mahjong to Final Fantasy fourteen, and I played a couple games, and I had no clue what was going on. Yeah, it's kind of like Rummy, but you have like Yaku similar to Koei Koei. So you got, yeah. you're scoring your Aku and not sets of triplets. Uh, but yeah, I'm definitely interested in Koi Koi. But the thing about the Mahjong set that I have from Nintendo, I got the Mario set. And the problem that I have with it is that every single card uh, has like a picture of a critter on it. And so it's kind of hard to know the difference between a point card, like a 10-point card, and a trash or a junk card. Because every card has a character on it. So... Wait, the the Mahjong set, did you say, or the Hanafuda yeah. set? Uh, the Hanafuda set. Yeah, yeah I've, so, I've got that set as well. I was like, oh, this will be neat to do demos. Yeah, these are pretty cool here. But, yeah, I wish they just had characters. And, like, the boar, the butterfly, and the deer is, like, all Mario. It's, like, Mario in a tanuki suit and Mario in a frog suit or something. So I think yeah. the Nintendo cards are cute, but... Uh, I've been playing on Steam the the Hanafuda game that you recommended. Yeah, been having a lot of fun with that, <laughs> and uh, but it's a lot of getting to know the different suits and what distinguishes like a Sakura from a, a Ume, a plum tree, and and a maple tree. And then once you start to get to know what makes the suits different, it makes it easier to know which cards match together. Yeah, yeah, that. 
like it's hard to start with a Mario set, but once you know the cards, they look kind of like the standard card set. Mm-hmm. So exactly. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I mean, video games are a good way to, or video game adaptions of board games are a good way to learn. Yeah, like the only disappointment with the uh, Steam version of Koei Koei is like if you like play a card and then you draw one from the stack, it will automatically match for you uh, unless there's more than one that you can match with. So you're really yeah. not learning what matches together. Or yeah. But it is helpful, like, if you have a card in your hand and you want to play it against another one, you know which cards, it'll actually highlight which ones you can match with. So it is a good learning tool that way. Yeah. So, yeah, that'll be cool. Yeah, everyone out there, come come to the kickoff and play Koei Koei and Mahjong with this, or at least Koei Koei. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to, I, you'll have to teach me Mahjong, because... I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm still learning. We might just do Koei Koei and just like look at the tile. So the Mahjong, so I got them down here. Oh. So the Mahjong set that I have, and there's like a hundred tiles or whatever. The problem with these is like if you play a game like Yakuza or you, you got go, Gutoku, uh, like the numbered tiles, they will actually have the like the Arabic numerals up here. But these, you actually have to know the Chinese characters. So, I mean, yeah. you, you can still match them with the other tiles. But if you're doing like a three, four, and a five, and some of them like, oh, this is a three right here, and it's just three lines. But this is a five right here. And this doesn't even look like the standard like typeface five when you're reading kanji. This is like the styled old Chinese version of a five. So some of the characters are even different from what I'm used to seeing. So yeah, I, I'll, I'll bring those and we can look at them and talk about, about them if anything else. Okay, so I noticed, let me share out again. Share screen, screen share. Um, I noticed on the Knoxville Game Design uh, Facebook group, which I thought was kind of dead, but someone posted here. I don't know who this person is, Adam Lupu, but he is having uh, a game get together. It sounded like Ludum Dare. I was like, oh, is this Ludum Dare? But it's a weekend game jam idea to play testing in 48 hours. Um, so this sounds like it's board games, video games, or anything. I don't know who this person is. Like, go at your own risk. I, I, I don't know anything about this group. I think this might be the same people that did the other gaming event, Connor Cole. I think that was July 20th. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this might be the same group. I'm not sure. But yeah, just wanted to put that this out there if anybody's interested in that. Okay, so last month did a talk on uh, random number generators. And yeah, sorry about the audio quality last time. I forgot to hit my uh, record button <laughs> on OBS, but we we're able to save most of the audio from Dylan's backup from Twitch. Uh, but yeah, I was talking about random number generators and I was talking about how to generate random numbers on Linux or Unix. And the method that I used was by getting the system time in millis and doing a mod with that. And that's a good way to do it. There's actually another way that I heard about recently, um, which I guess I kind of knew about, but I never looked at. There's actually a file on every Linux system called dev random. There's actually a dev u random and dev a random. I think the only difference is, is like the U random is maybe asynchronous or maybe that's the A random. I'm not exactly sure about that. I've seen people recommend don't just use dev random because it will block other processes from running and it can lock up a system. But basically you can just like do a cat, like display the characters from dev random and that will give you a continuous stream of random bytes. So a byte typically is uh, 8 bits, which is an num- integer, or a number you can cast that as an integer from 0 to 255. So using that, that may give you a better source of random numbers if you're working on Linux. So basically I have this little script here where I write 
just like a line of random bytes out to a file. Then I leap through those lines and print out the numbers. So I actually have that up and running right here in my MinGW. MinGW is like a Linux Unix emulator that you can run in a window uh, on Windows. And so but just basically loops through here and it looks at all those ASCII characters. And this is supposed to be a better source of random numbers. Uh, from what I read online, to will actually get like information from your hard drive, like how hot your hard drive is running or how, how, how much it's vibrating or something. I'm not sure about all the details. Uh, but it does give you a set of random characters, which you can convert to integers. Then once you have those integers, then you can then do your mod like six if you needed number zero to five or mod uh, 19 or mod 20 if you needed number zero to 19. So yeah, just want to throw that out there. Uh, I do have a script called <coughs> devrandom.sh which I'll share out and people can run themselves. Okay, didn't want to talk about that Yeah, Nox game design. Yeah, I guess that was it for news. Dylan, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about or show off? Um, no, not that I can think of. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and start on the topic for this month, which is uh, game development for small talk. So I thought this was kind of like low-hanging fruit. I learned small talk uh, using the Squeak development environment in college back years ago, <laughs> like 20 years ago, back in 98 or 1999. So I was like, oh, yeah, I've used this before, and you can make games with it, too. So I was like, okay, well, I don't think a lot of people have heard about small talk. So I was like, okay, this will be an easy talk for me to do. I just need to brush up a little bit. I wanted to brush up on small talk anyway. So I was like, oh, this is a good opportunity uh, to look at it again. So, yeah, here's a... Uh a graph that I found. There's a lot of like charts like this online that show the history of programming languages. So you can go all the way back to Fortran, or I, th I guess the there's really really old ones like Plan Calcul or something. Uh, but yeah, like the, one of the uh, more mainstream was Fortran. Uh, and Algol, I know a lot of languages came from, yeah, Algol 58 and Algol 68, a lot of languages derived from that. But Smalltalk was really the first object-oriented language, or one of the more mainstream ones, where everything is an object, so it really pushed the object-oriented paradigm. So you can see it right here in the center, and it derived from, like, Lisp and Simula. Uh, I think Simula and Modula it took a lot from those languages. But if you keep going down, you got Smalltalk, Smalltalk 80, <clears throat> and you go down and you can see like languages that are more common, like Java, also borrowed from Smalltalk, and also uh, Objective-C. I haven't done a lot of Objective-C, but I remember I looked at it like, I don't know, uh, years ago I looked at a little bit of Objective-C and I was like, oh yeah, this is just like Smalltalk using C syntax. So if you learn small talk, then uh, you know Objective-C. Which reminds me, that's the one thing that I forgot. So we did have a little bit of viewer mail that I wanted to go ahead and show off right here. So this was an email that I got in July. I forgot to mention it last month. Um, so James wrote in to us and said, do you all know any places in Knoxville that video game designers meet maybe once a week? or once a month, or any annual events? Or would you know of any video game designing businesses that my stepbrother and I could work at? So I responded to James. I was like, well, um, I don't know of many game development uh, jobs here in Knoxville, but if you do have game development skills, like if you know C Sharp, if you know... Um, how to do 3D modeling and programming. There's a lot of jobs out there. Uh, they, they just aren't necessarily game related. But you can use this, the skills that you learn from developing a game um, to, to find other jobs out there. I, I actually recently uh, helped someone get a job or transfer jobs 
because I knew of a VR development opportunity. Uh, so he's like, okay, I know this one guy. He does a lot of game development. He knows how to do augmented reality. He would be a good fit and everything. So, uh, yeah, you can definitely use those skills to find other positions. But, yeah, we, uh, I responded to James here. I said, hey, yeah, we meet once a month online, and then we get together for our Ludum Dare events, I guess, which is twice a year now. Then we have little other random events throughout the year yeah i saw that they had creepy con recently but i don't think they're doing the gaming portion of this year so i'll be on the lookout for any other events like that okay so the reason that made me think about this email was that i i get a lot of inquiries because i think i have like on my linkedin that i have done small talk and there's a lot of people out there looking for small talk developers I guess just because it is kind of an obscure language that not everybody teaches uh, and they probably have legacy code and they need a developer to like figure out what they're to fix their small talk code. But yeah, some of these languages like I use like Ruby, it derived from small talk, like any object oriented language uh, borrows from small talk. So anyway, the Development environment that I started learning was called Squeak, and you can get that at squeak.org. It looks like they've been updating it. Let's see your downloads. I started using it, like I said, in 1999, which was probably Squeak 2 or Squeak 3. Maybe it's later, because this looks familiar right here, but it might have been Squeak 2 or even Squeak 1. But it's kind of like a virtual development environment for doing small talk. Let me go ahead and bring up my slides here. Um, so the first version of Smalltalk was released in 1972, but it wasn't publicly released until 1980 in Smalltalk 80. And oh, by the way, let me stop screen sharing. And this is the book that I used. It's Smalltalk 80, the language. So it has a lot of good stuff about oh, how... The, the syntax of the language, all about objects, and all that good stuff. So this, so this is a good reference, but uh, yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about the syntax in a little bit. So share screen, screen share. Okay, so I already talked. It, it was created by Alan Kay and others at Xerox Park back in the 70s, and yeah, you know, a lot of good stuff came out of Xerox Park. I know that's, I think that's where they created the mouse and. Uh, or came up with the idea by Douglas Engelbart and just like the concept of windowing systems which uh, a good movie is Pirates of Silicon Valley which was on TNT years ago and goes all into about uh, how all the stuff that Xerox Park came out with back in the day and then basically Microsoft and Apple came along and <laughs> yeah, borrowed some of that and borrowed some of their ideas but yeah, the concept of small talk, everything's an object. Uh, and one thing that's kind of, as a game developer, I always want to like destroy objects or free objects, like whenever an enemy is destroyed, but nothing is ever destroyed in small talk. There's concept of garbage collection, which Java borrowed this concept. So basically objects uh, are in memory until this garbage collector comes around and frees them. And the only way that it knows that an object needs to be free is that nothing else is pointing. Like, I won't go into the whole concept of pointers and everything, but basically you have these uh, places in memory with memory addresses to different structures or objects. And so once nothing is pointing to that object, then it gets garbage, collect, garbage collected, so you, it frees up memory for your program. So a good way to free up an object is uh, there's a delete keyword, which doesn't delete it immediately. It just sets the object's owner to nil, so nothing's pointing at it. So I started talking a little bit about Squeak. Uh, it's available for Windows, Mac, and Linux, and it was first released in 1996. So Smalltalk is the language. Squeak is the implementation. Now, I think there's other implementations of Smalltalk out there. I think a new one is called Faro or something. I haven't used that, but I've seen when I was doing some research on Smalltalk, I saw a lot of references to Faro. <clears throat> and 
So if you wonder if there's been anything of, of Node created in Smalltalk, well, the original version of Scratch was created in Squeak and Smalltalk. And I remember using it like a while back, and I was like, oh, yeah, this looks a lot like Smalltalk, especially some of the error messages and things like that. But I think they rewrote Squeak like in JavaScript or something like that. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start out like showing off some of the games. And this is one of the reasons why I thought this would be a good topic for this meetings month, because I already knew there were games built in. Uh, you just go into Squeak, you left click, and bring up objects and games, and then you can drag these different games onto your desktop. So close that. So I'm running the latest version of Squeak. I think it's 5, something other. Whenever you start it up, it's going to prompt you. If you only have one image, then it's not going to ask you to pick an image. But if you only have one, then it's going to prompt you. Basically, an image is like a, a copy of the Squeak VM, sort of. So, yeah, I'm going to just click here and go into Objects. And then I'll bring up all these different objects that you can play with. And let's see here. I want to minimize that one right there. Oh, minimize. No, minimize. I don't really know. I'll go ahead and close it. Okay. So if you click on games right here, there's like all these games that you can view. And you can like drag it right there. And it's like a chess game right there. In the middle, click these and it will actually... Ooh, I guess you don't want to do that. <laughs> Sometimes you can make them bigger. You can like rotate it like that. So there's all these different like handles where you can... Uh, move things around and duplicate games. I guess rotating doesn't always isn't always the best, and it can kind of mess it up. But yeah, uh, yeah. So if you play chess, don't resize it. You got Chinese checkers right here, so you can uh, play a standard game of Chinese checkers. It's got AI built in. Uh, I don't know if you can play more than two players or not. I'm not the best Chinese checker player in the world. There's free cell. Ooh, that was loud. Um, and I forgot how to play Free Cell. I remember it used to be on Windows back in the day. Uh, I think it's kind of a solitaire type game where you can play with one player. This thing called Same right here where you can click on it and like click the same colors and you try to like match the colors and remove all the blocks on the screen. And then they got good old Tetris right here. Uh, which you can move the buttons around and drop the pieces and rotate the pieces and things like that. So the good thing about this, and I'll talk, oh, there's also my, your classic Minesweeper game. It's where you click the board uh, and you try not to click the mines. <laughs> I'm not having very good games, so you can mark the squares and click them like that. The good thing is, is all the code for all these games are built in right into small talk uh, and i'll show that in a little bit uh there's also this thing called just for fun so it has like these little cool demo type things like these bouncing atoms or simulates about these little bouncing balls you got like a clock and uh one cool thing there's like a magnifier so you can actually see up close what your mouse is hovering over i don't know if you can make that one yeah this is one you can actually make bigger right here uh, you got moving eyes which is just fun stuff to play with so these little eyes move around and look at you you got like a key press finder which i'll talk a little bit more about this but it can detect different keys that you press and just random things thought bubbles there's also like under graphics you can I think there's like a paint program where you can draw lines and colors and change your color, things like that. So there's a lot built in here. I remember when I was learning this, it's like, oh, okay, and they'd give you a project, and it's like, okay, go out and download Squeak and like create a web browser in this. So uh, there's a lot to dig into. They, they got like other just like random rectangles and shapes and things like that too. But yeah, you can like write web browsers and do HTTP requests and all sorts of good stuff with this as well. Uh, so that was the games just for fun. Yeah, so the code for the games is under... Uh, this thing called eToy Squeakland, so you can right click here. I'll talk about the browser in a little bit, but I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. 
So all the like categories uh, from, that your code is in is over here in this left column right here. So you got eToy, Squeakland, and what was one like Tetris or something? It might be all in, yeah, I think it's all under games. So if you go to eToy, Squeakland, Morphic Games, and you can like click on Tetris, and you'll find a lot of the yeah, a lot of the methods and classes to run Tetris right here. And like you got a Tetris block and a board and a game and all this other stuff. So it looks like they have every all the games classes crammed into one category right here. But yeah, the code is in there. Uh, yeah, so I talked about this. Uh, there's also, I think I had it on like an earlier version of Squeak, Squeak 3.9. Some of the same stuff, but this one has like a keyboard right here. I know, Dylan, you probably can't hear this through the, the screen sharing right here, but they do have like additional things for audio and video and things like that. And I think it's only available in the earlier versions of Squeak. There's also a thing called flaps, and you can see a few additional things. You just click on flaps right there and uh, show shared flaps. So it's kind of like these little pop-out uh, toolbars right here, and you can go to widget, and you can get some of the same things, object catalog, through these flaps right here on the side. And there's one for tools over here on the right side. Uh, yeah, so minimize that. So, so how do you, starting out with small talk, I just want to do a hello world. How do you do hello world in, in small talk and squeak? Well, there's this thing called the transcript window. So to get a transcript window, you just uh, left click and go to transcript. So to do hello world, you just do transcript, which is an object. And then there's a, so, Smalltalk uses messages, which are basically the equivalent of a method or a procedure or a function. So you do transcript and you want to call show, and any parameter is followed by a colon. So we want to show, and we want to show the string hello world. And all uh, lines of code are, in a, are completed with a period instead of a semicolon. So you want to highlight that, and then you basically right click or you can do alt D I'm gonna do right click here and you just say do it so everything's executed by do it so that's going to print hello world right there in the screen uh, right in the transcript window sometimes I always like move my cursor down a little bit then do alt D that way so you can see hello world right there I actually have two instances of the transcript window up so it actually sends the message or prints it to both transcript windows right there. So that's how you do hello world. Typically I do alt A to select everything if that's all I have in there and do uh, alt D. Uh, but yeah, here's the standard format of uh, of a line of code in Smalltalk, which I mentioned your class or object message. Then if it has parameters, do a colon after each before each parameter value. So in Squeak, uh, the API is all defined in the browser, which I showed briefly, but you know, left click, click on browser. So this is like all the classes. You can like do a search right here for, where is it at? Classes, find, I don't see it right. Oh, find class, very first thing at the top. So I can do trans, I think it's in here. There's transcript. Maybe transcript is a special case, I'm not sure. But it's like if we want to know about an integer, we can like search integer and click on that. And it'll find the integer class. And then it will show all the methods that are or messages that are available for class. So the one nice thing about Squeak and Smalltalk is there's tons of things that are implemented in here. It's not really well documented, but you have like your standard plus and uh, multiply, divide, and all that. But you have stuff like uh, get it as a year or get a random integer your bitwise operations and increment and f your floors and your square roots and all that. And so there's a lot of stuff built in here. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, I, di I didn't mention it earlier. So the first column is, as, as I mentioned, your categories of classes. So you really don't use the first column for anything other than organization. Your cl all your classes are in this second column right here. So these are the things that you call. The, the classes that you instantiate are all here in the second column. Then you have this third column, which is similar to the first column. These are just like categor categorizations of the messages or the, the methods and the procedures. So you really don't use anything in this third column aside from like filtering your your messages then in this fourth column these are all your messages things that you call on your classes and objects and oh by the way you can click this button right here to switch between class messages and instance messages so an instance of an object is created using the new keyword very similar to C sharp very similar to Java except that you put the new after the class that you want to instantiate. So the difference between an instance message and a class message, an instance is called on an instance of an object, an something that has an object that has been created with using the new keyword. Where a class message can be called directly on the class without instantiating it. Okay. So how do you make a new class? Well, you basically just edit the API directly. So you can like click over here and you can do add. It's actually called add item. So it's going to ask you for a new category name. So I'm just going to say my test accept. So I have my test now in the system browser. So I'm just going to click in the second column. So basically, uh, as in uh, Java, and I think. C sharp as well. Everything is uh, has object as a superclass, or everything you can trace all the way back up to the hierarchy tree up to object. So you can say like my new class, and then basically you just right click and uh, accept or do Alt S. And then you have my new class right here in your API. You can create instance variables by putting them between the single quotes under instance variable names, like just do foo and bar, do alt s, and now I have two instance variables in my new class. Uh, then you can click in this third column and it'll bring up a default message for you. So I'm just going to do my message and I can do like transcript show this is my new message let's then save that so now it shows my message over here in this fourth column as a message on my new class so yeah now we can go over to our transcript window and just say just say uh, just call it a so you declare a variable between pipes and do a and then your assignment operator is a colon followed by an equal sign. So I want to do my new class new. So that creates an instance of my new class and assigns it to A. So then we want to do A, my message. And put a couple lines and then we say do that. So there it says my new message right there when I ran that. So that's how you create, met, create an object or create a new class, create messages on objects. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. So basically, I talked about this already. If you want to return a value, like in a function, you use the caret at the end of your code block, then whatever value you want to return uh, from that message. And there's a special message called initialize, which is kind of like a constructor. So that always gets called uh, the very first time that object is instantiated. So if you need to set up any instance variables, you put it in a special message called initialize. So I talked about uh, the API a little bit already. Uh, if you look in a book like the Smalltalk 80 book, it will have the colon equal used for assignment. It will be written as a, like an arrow pointing 
left words. I think old versions of Squeak actually converted the colon equal to that arrow, but I think in the latest version it, it, it doesn't do that anymore. And sometimes you'll actually see the return caret as an arrow pointing upward and not a caret. So I talked about that. So saving. So I wrote some code, now I want to save it. So there's actually two different ways to save it. You can save the image, like this little squeak VM, by left clicking, and you can do either save or save as. Then that will bring up a little file browser saying just say uh, my new squeak image or my new squeak dot image. So that will actually save everything in your like squeak VM right here. So if you open that up, then it'll look exactly like this. But there's another way to save your code. You can click on your category or class, and you can do file out, and that will write out your code into a, to a file using that category name .st. So let's see if I can find this on my local system here. So go LD Smith uh, tools. So, so it puts it in the directory uh, of your squeak VM, your squeak instance. So my new squeak. So there's my new squeak image where it saved out the image. And what was the name of the class? Uh, my test. So out of, out of curiosity, the file that it's writing, is that a binary file or a text file or what? Yeah, so the squeak image, so if we try to open this up with Notepad, that's going to be a binary file. So it's going to be like all gobbledygook. Okay. And if you do the file out, then open this with Notepad. Um, then this is actually text that you can read. Now, I wouldn't... Okay. I wouldn't recommend that anybody go and like actually try to write their own ST file. <laughs> it's a lot easier to do it in uh, in the Squeak VM. But yeah, yeah get... I was thinking. Oh, go ahead. I was thinking in terms of like if you wanted to put stuff in source control or something like that. Exactly. So if you want to put something in source control, I'd recommend doing the file out. Uh, that, yeah. That way, if you upload to GitHub or or Bitbucket or whatever, then it can actually track the changes in your code. And it also keeps some like helpful information like a timestamp that you made the changes and your initials. The very first time you commit a change or very first time you do a change, it will prompt you for your initials. So you just put that in. So yeah, good question. Uh, yeah, so, so, and that's the one thing when I was in doing my undergrad in computer science, we would have to turn in our homework, so basically our small talk programs. So we would do the file out, so it was like in a, a text format that could be submitted and everything. I don't think the image files are huge, but it's probably not something that I would want to check into source control. Um, yeah, my new squeak image is 46 megabytes, where my test is just one kilobyte. So definitely save a lot of, and like you were saying, Dylan, once you upload to source control, then you can track changes and things like that. Uh, and yeah, that's kind of like the point that I had right here. Uh, you can send your code if you file out to other squeak users without sending your whole image, export the code control. Uh, disaster recovery. Yeah, I think it's just a better way than like doing saving an entire image in case you lose your entire image or whatever. If you have it written out to an ST file, then it's easier to recover that way. Uh, yeah, and saving the workspace will only save it locally. Okay, so more so Squeak has this thing called Morphic. They they had some like really uh, simplistic windowing uh, windowing API in the original version of Squeak. But then they came out with this new thing called Morphic, which adds a lot more uh, components, items for doing things in a GUI. Uh, this is very similar to like if you know Java, you got AWT and Swing, or if you do things under Linux, typically I use GTK, the GNU windowing toolkit. Or GTK plus three. So basically, Morphic is kind of the same thing. Another name for a windowing toolkit. So in Morphic, everything has 
like a little ring around it. So I'm going to go ahead and close this one right here. Save changes, no. Open squeak. And get my number of guests out here. Uh, so everything, I think, yeah, even like this uh, API browser, it's a morphic item, and your transcript window is a morphic item. And all those little games and widgets that I was talking about earlier, those are morphic items as well. So it has this little ring right here. The one thing I don't like is that uh, it's not really well documented uh, what all of these little buttons do like the little uh, yellow one in the lower right that obviously makes your window bigger one cool thing is like this lower left hand one the red one it's a rotate so you can basically rotate any item and squeak so it's kind of weird but you can like just like start typing rotated like that um i, I don't know i think since squeak is so old uh there really isn't a, uh, I don't think it takes advantage of your 3D graphics cards. I think this is all running on the processor because I notice if I instantiate too many things and I rotate too many things, then it'll start slowing down. Um, I think this brown one is duplicate or maybe it's the red one. Yeah, there's one in here. Oh, maybe it's the green one. Yeah, so green one will duplicate. So we'll make a copy of that instance of whatever you're using right there, which is kind of cool. Um, so while I'm talking about this, I don't know if I had a slide on it or not, but yeah, I did like, like I recommend if you're starting out in any new game development environment or anything, do a simple number guessing game. So I'm going to create a new variable called num guess, and then I want to uh, do num guess gets. So I created this class earlier called Number Guess, which is a simple number guessing game. So I think uh, I'm do Number Guess uh, New. Let's see if I can run that. Okay, so this is going to. So if you look at my, oops, I didn't like that. So I just type 42. So basically, what this is going to do, it's going to prompt you to enter a number, and then base based on what number you guessed from 1 to 100, it's either going to say higher or lower. So I guess 42, the number was higher, so let's do uh, 75. Put that in there. So now it says lower. So it's between 42 and 75, so let's do 50. Except, so 50, let's do 62, it's higher than 50. Uh, it's between 50 and 62, so let's do 57. So it's between 50 and 57, 53, higher 55, higher 56. You win, eight guesses. So basically, look at this code. We got the initialize, initialize method. It's going to pick a secret number from 1 to 100 at random. Then it's got this instance, instance variable called guesses. We're going to set that to 0. So we're going to say while, and this is the structure of an if state, or a while loop. You do your comparison on top. So while the guest number does not equal the secret number, while that's true, then we're going to prompt the user to guess a number. And then if, it's, if the guest number is greater than the secret number, we're going to print lower. If the guest number is less than the secret number, we're going to print higher. Then if it's equal, then we're going to show you win your total number of guesses. And, yeah, and, and then since it's equals, then it just stops. Um, so where it prompts for the user, I'm going to call self, which is a reference to the current object. It's kind of like this in Java and I think C Sharp. So we're going to call guest number. So basically all set guest number is going to do is going to assign to this number guess um, variable. It's going to use this fill in the blank morph, which is that little thing that prompts. And it's just going to put guess for the prompt. And then it's going to get the value that the user pressed in. Then it's going to increment the number of users guesses by one and then return that guest number. And then I have this little helper message which uh, shows the secret number right there, which isn't actually called in the game, but just kind of helpful for debugging. 
Uh, so yeah, that's kind of an example of a simple morph right there, little guest window. Uh, every morph has a position, an extent, which is another name for the size, a background color, and a name. So I want to know, can I just like create a simple little space shooter in Smalltalk? So that's kind of my objective of doing this. So. Uh, I made a subclass of this rectangle morph, which is basically like a simple rectangle, a simple gooey rectangle. Uh, set the color to uh, gray. One thing you got to watch out for, whenever you're making a subclass of another object and you're initialized, initial, <laughs> initialize, you want to make sure you call super initialize unless you have a really good reason not to, because if you don't call initialize, on the super class then there may be some variables that don't get set up correctly so I think some languages I want to say Java call super by default in its constructor and I think uh, in C sharp uh, you use the base base dot super or something I can't remember but I know you use the keyword base for calling the super class constructor so it's a good idea to call that unless you have a good re reason not to uh, one thing you got to watch out for in Smalltalk is the position of your object, of your morph, is not relative to the parent. So you may have your parent object, your parent like screen in the middle of the screen, but if you set your subclass component to 0, 0, then it's going to show up in the upper left-hand corner. So it is possible for the position of a child to be outside its parent. So here's some sample code that I have right here that I was talking about. So I set up the position and set the color of the background to black, set the name of the, the, the morph to simple six shooter, then I create this new ship, which is basically a subclass of the morph rectangle, set its position to 320 by 400, then add the position of the parent uh, to that, so we make sure it's inside. And yeah, this is where I'm setting it to gray, uh, using RGB, color RGB, to, uh, set all these to 0.8, um, so do self color set it to that C variable. So okay, so let me close this. Let's save changes. So I'm going to open up. So here's where I'm going to an uh, image. So the first simple shooter image. I'm going to bring it up here. So this is basically the code that I was talking about right here. I uh, got a simple gray box. Then whenever you press the left key and right key, just move the box around. So anybody making, starting out making games, this is how you start out. Just, just get something moving around right there. Um, so I think on the next slide, yeah, I talk about handling keyboard events. So handling keyboard events <laughs> in Smalltalk and Squeak is not trivial. But the good thing is, is there's this thing, let me go back, I think it's under objects, uh, key press, it's called the key press morph, and is it under graphics or tools, scripting, presentation, multimedia, uh, key, yeah, it's under just for fun, so I can drag this out, click on it, and then it says press a new key, so I'm going to press F. So I think I showed this off a little bit er earlier. So whatever key you set it to, it'll like, move whenever you press that key. I got this other one over here for L. So if you want to handle keyboard events, what I recommend doing is looking at, you can go into your browser, then in your API browser, find, go to find class, and then you can type in keyboard event morph. Bring that up. And what you want to look for is in these methods, you got like an event, and I think there's a handle keyboard event somewhere in here. I'm not seeing it at the moment. But basically, I would just recommend copying or borrowing the code in here for handling, uh, handling um, keystrokes. You can go up here, and I'll, I'll just show it in the game that I created and go down to, and I'll share out the code I'll put all this on github and put a link on the website but here's a simple shooter got the initial initialize right there and simple ship and these are the methods that I was talking about so we got a handle mouse event handle listen event and handle keyboard event but also a register event unregister to event so it can get a little bit hairy 
it's not as simple as Unity where you just do input dot get access or anything. But in your handle keyboard event, you can get a reference to the key pressed, and it's using this key pressed and event key string, and then you get it as a lowercase. Then you can compare this key pressed to either like your arrow keys. It comes out as like a less than left greater than symbol or just a regular key and just like type in an R or spaces like less than space greater than space. So based on what key you press, you can move the ship to the left, or move it up, down, left, right. And points are denoted by an integer, an at sign, then a second integer. And I think you have to put a space between that at sign and uh, the second integer if it's negative or else it'll have problems. Okay, so that's basically moving a box around right there. Um, and basically, I talked about this. You have to do your own balance checking to make sure that the box doesn't go outside the parent, which is kind of a pain. But you can either, you can use this self position to get the X, to set the X and Y position. Uh, I think there's also a left and right for the bounding box. That's where it gets a little bit confusing as well. And then you can set the width and height using self width and self height. I think sometimes if you set the X position, then it keeps the right position the same. So you can actually expand the size of your object if you're not careful. So the game loop, uh, basically there's two special methods, step and step time. Step is where it's kind of like an update in Unity. Uh, it's called based on these a breakpoint time, which is the value returned and set time. Typically, if you want 30 frames per second, you just return 33 for step time. So I'll show you that next, I believe. Oops, don't want that one. Quit, yes. Uh, simple Shooter 2. So yeah, here's one where I have three enemies. So if we look at the simple ship, and so I have my step. So in step, I'm going to, I'm using the shoot delay so somebody can't just like hold down the button and shoot repeatedly. So I got the shoot delay and uh, subtract, yeah, so I'll subtract step time every time if the shoot delay is greater than zero. So step, step time just returns 33, which is uh, how often step gets executed. So it is kind of nice in another version of this, in a later version, which I'll show in a little bit, you can actually set the break time for an enemy to like one, like a thousand milliseconds, which is one second, so that it moves every second. So you can have different characters or different objects update in different intervals, which is pretty cool. I haven't seen that in any other game development environment. Usually you're just constrained by one constant update. Uh, otherwise you have to keep track of how often you update the object yourself. Okay, so did I, I have the shooting working in it? Yeah, so I press space and looks like all these have already been shot. So I'm going to see if I can close this and then run that right there. So yeah, the three enemies start out green. Oh, and by the way, if you're creating a new morphic object, you got to you do your instance variable gets then the name new, but then you also have to say open in world. Otherwise, you won't see so let's shoot this one so he turns red shoot him he turns red so basically if we look at it i got a bullet object that updates every every 33 milliseconds so it's going to call self move and self check collision so basically all self move does is move it up by five pixels <laughs> And then it uh, destroys the bullet if it goes greater than the owner's, owner's Y position. Uh, but in check collision, that's where it's actually going to loop through all of the enemies. Basically, in simple shooter, I set up a variable, a list of enemies. Let's see here. Click off that simple shooter. Yeah, so I declare an instance variable of list enemies. So whenever I call initial, initialize, then it's going to call restart game, which is going to set up this list of enemies, which is basically an array of three items. So we use array new, then pass in the parameter three. So this is kind of a sloppy way of doing this, but I just basically create three separate instances of the enemies, 
set their positions, then add those enemies to the list using uh, at one, at two, and at three. Then you use put to put that instance of that object into the list. So in my bullet check collision, I'm basically just going to get a reference to that list. Then one really nice thing about Smalltalk and Squeak is you have this intersects uh, message which basically compares the bounding boxes of two things. So basically I'm checking the bounding box of the bullet against the bounding box of the enemy. And if it returns true for those two things intersecting, then I'm going to set the color of the enemy to red. So that's what changes the color right there. Uh, so I talked about shoot delay right there. So uh, I already talked about that. So yeah. You, yeah, so basically, yeah, so the space shooter is a good way to start out after you do your simple number guessing game. And I talked about this, it's sort of um, One thing you got to watch out for is if you're using an instance variable uh, for an instance of your object and you start doing things on that in your uh, initial initialize method sometimes step actually gets called before initialize so you got to make sure that you check for null before using your variable or else you'll start getting lots of error windows uh, one other thing you got to do is to make sure that you uh, whenever you update your object call changed on the parent morph otherwise there may be artifacts left over uh, from your object so, what was this? Was this number two? I'm going to close this one. Don't save changes. And let's look at three right here. I think this is basically the same, but I basically added to this version uh, a score, which sometimes gets formatted kind of strange. I haven't figured that out yet. But So now I have it where you move the block around, you shoot, and whenever your bullet collides and it's going to remove uh, that enemy and also increment your scores. So let's look at this real quick. Go down to and if you're looking for your custom one bad thing about this browser is it a lot of times it doesn't put these in order like you got your K's before the C's but usually it puts your custom classes down here at the bottom. So go to the bottom look at simple shooter and look at bullet check collision so now if the bullet intersects with the enemy and also add this flag enemy is alive because uh, like I said earlier in this presentation delete isn't immediate so you gotta like set a flag to check if it's alive or not we're going to uh, call this function enemy set dead and then the owner of this of the bullet is the actual game, the simple shooter object. So we're going to call it an add score. So simple shooter, add score, this just takes a parameter for points. So we're going to increment the points by 100, then update the text on the screen. And then in the enemy, we're going to, here's the set dead method. So it's basically just going to set is alive to false. Uh, and then we also have a get is alive. So the one thing, if you're coming from languages like C Sharp, one thing that's kind of annoying is typically like instance variables in C Sharp, you can set it to public and access the variables directly that way. But in Smalltalk, everything's private pretty much. So if you want to access anything, you got to create a get and set method. So I remember that's one thing they really drilled into our head when I was an undergrad. It's like, oh, create getters and setters for everything, which is kind of annoying if I just want to set a value, but I guess it's programmatically the best way to do things. So yeah, so we're going to set the enemy to dead, set that flight to dead, then we're going to delete the enemy, basically setting the owner uh, to nil so it gets removed from the screen. Uh, so now we're going to look at the final version that I did last, finished up last night. Simple Shooter 004. And see if it's running. So in this final version, we got it up and running already. I got the enemies moving around now. So they move left and right. We look at the enemy. And so I added a step and step time. So the step time for this one is a thousand. 
So these are going to update every second and basically they're going to call move in the step. So move basically moves it by this instance variable, which is velocity x. So it's going to move it left and right by 10 pixels. Once it gets to a bound, which I have set to 300, then it's going to start moving the opposite direction. Or if it gets down below 100, then it's going to start moving in the right direction. So we can click this, shoot, and as, as it happened before, they delete whenever they collide. And I also added an additional uh, command in handle keyboard event. If you look down here, if the key pressed is R, then we're going to call on the simple shooter, like the level manager object restart game. So I can press R then it starts over again. It doesn't reset your score currently, but uh, one neat thing is you can click on this and like pull this out and create like two instances of the game. It's exact, like deep, it's actually a deep copy. It doesn't like create just a new instance. It creates, it creates everything, the complete state of the object. Uh, like that. And then we can press R, so we're going to have to. And this is where it gets kind of slow if we kind of rotate this around. You can still move it around. I think the, the intersect method doesn't work correctly when it's rotated, so that's one downside to that. So the one thing that I wasn't able to do is get an image uh, for the, the player and the enemies. I, I looked into it, I just couldn't figure it out. There is a lot of documentation out here uh, online. It isn't documented really well in Squeak, but there's a lot of examples. Uh, let's see if I can control click that right there. Come on. So here's a, a lot of different books you can look at. And I, I kind of like the terse guide to Squeak. It's got like a lot of examples of how to manipulate variables and objects, all the different uh, messages which you can uh, call on different types of objects right there. But yeah, if you're interested in doing morphic and things like that, there's lots of documentation on, on morphic, like morphic for beginners, how to create different components. And I still haven't seen what, I guess they call it the halo, like the explanation. I actually started documenting some of that on this slide right here. So I guess the X is closed, the, this one's minimized, the brown circle, the I is some sort of properties, uh, and rotate scale. There's a color picker, so you can set the background to whatever color you want. Uh, I guess I'll just show that really quickly. Uh, so we got our game here. Middle click it, you can select this color picker. So if I want the background to be red, then you can set it to red. Since every morphic item has a background property. I think I can actually click one of the specific enemies as well and do a color picker for that. And like if I want it to be blue, and so now you got a blue enemy that you updated in real time, which is kind of neat. Okay, save now. Uh, see here. Uh, so that's the coding guide, morphic, more information on that, and a good book on Squeak by example. I think they use Squeak a lot at Disney because I think this document right here, I brought it up, is actually, and I remember hearing that a long time ago that uh, Disney used small talk and Squeak, but you can bring this up right here. Uh, maybe it's the other version, but uh, yeah, lots of good examples in there. So anyway, that's basically all I had for small talk. Stop sharing. Uh, Dylan, did you have any <laughs> questions or <laughs> find it interesting or? Uh, yeah, it was pretty neat. I've, uh, I've never used small talk and I, I don't necessarily see myself going back and like the VM thing seems really complicated, but yeah. um, I think if you're getting into programming, that might be helpful. Um, yeah. because everything's there. Yeah, I saw a couple of things about like using it as a learning example and things like that. But yeah, I think in one of the like next, so next month, 
the meeting will be showing off Ludumdara games. But maybe the month after that, I'll do Squeak. Or not Squeak. Uh, Scratch. Scratch, <laughs> yeah. Not a mouse, but a cat. Uh, so, yeah, I may do Scratch for that because I know it's a little bit more widely used. Uh, they got, like, a repository where you can load your games online and things like that. Uh, so I think that will be a good one. I, I got a list. I, I think I mentioned it before, but I went and updated. Like, our... Our Knoxville Game Design Forums. Let me share this out. Share. Screen share. Um, Knoxville Game Design. So I added the link to the podcast directly. So anyone out there wants to get our podcast, it's right there on the main menu right now. Uh, so you can click on it. Because I was like, I actually went to some other sites that I knew had podcasts. I was like, how, how, where in the world is their podcast button? So I was like, okay, I can see how that can be hard to find. So I wanted to put the podcast right there. Uh, you can join our Discord server. You can get the link right there, in Discord right there. So we do a lot of uh, our discussions and things, sharing. Like, if you want to get the powerpoint slides especially when i do it if you want to get it before our meeting just to check it out and know, know what we're going to be talking about uh i usually try to post that on the discord channel and other things as well uh but the thing i came here for is you go to forums and you go to i think it's group and side information yeah i created this thread called up coming meeting topics so i just kind of outlined some of the topics that we've been talking about so probably so i just put later 2019 for scratch allegro and java uh but yeah none of the well next month we're doing the lunum dari 45 show off anyone out there want to talk about anything just let us know and we can add it to the list but i thought this was a good way of just like if anybody knows wants to know what the upcoming topics are it's all right there um but yeah as always, if you want to subscribe to the podcast or subscribe to the mailing list, uh, just to know when the upcoming meetings are and the upcoming get-togethers, you can just go right here and type in your email address and press subscribe. That will get you added to our mailing list. If you want the latest podcast, listen to the latest podcast, you can just play it right there directly on the website. We also have links on each of the like wrap-up posts on where to, where to get it like on stitcher and google play and itunes and as always we have links to the meeting videos i'm still looking at other video sites i haven't really found anything uh there's like pros and cons to every video site um yeah uh, youtube is good it's getting harder to have your videos found because of like their new algorithms <laughs> so if you're if you're not a trusted source or whatever then it's it's harder to come up in the search results um oh, go ahead <laughs> yeah i mean I, can, I almost think of, of youtube as not being a place where you get found it's just a place where you distribute your your video distribute and archive <laughs> yeah so, I, I think twitch is really good um but yeah i've, I've looked at i've looked at vimeo i think I, i've been a vimeo user for years now the problem with them is they give you such a limited amount of disk space and how much you can upload every month for free but then even if you do their paid program then it's like, oh, we'll give you like two gigabytes instead of one. <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah. well, that's really not going to help me. I mean, it's good for artists if you just have like one a demo reel that you want to th show throw up, then that's good for them. But if you're doing a monthly podcast where you got uh, a video that's in, from four to eight gigs, that's not going to do very well. Uh, there are some other sites such as BitChute and DTube and all of those and those are like people who have gotten kicked off YouTube. Now, if BitChute got to where they had more general purpose content, then I think I would be willing to start putting stuff on BitChute, but I'm kind of apprehensive right now. Uh, yeah. Just because of the other content that's on BitChute. It's kind of like the Wild West, and it's the way YouTube used to be, but it's like, uh, I don't know if I want to be associated with all these other videos. So. I'll keep looking, and um, and I have a limited amount of this space, so 
Um, we could always host it ourselves, or I could host it on my website. Like I host the podcast MP3s on my own website, but uh, I think I do have like a hundred gigabyte limit on on my account. So anyway, uh, everyone, go check out Dylan's website. He's DylanWolf.com. Also, we do a live, usually D- Dylan live streams this on Twitch. So anybody that wants to, like, listen in but don't actually want to, like, jump on and get on the video and everything, you're welcome to check out Dylan's Twitch channel and look him up. I think it's DylanWolf underscore on Twitch. But, but yeah, you can get on there, send us questions. I, I, I usually don't monitor the chat uh, on Twitch in real time, but uh, you know that's another option. Uh, you can find us on, uh, like I mentioned earlier, iTunes and uh, all the other great places. So yeah, next month, yeah, come out, meet us at the Ludumdari kickoff on October 4th. Then next time we'll meet, I think it's like October 13th. So until next time, uh, see everybody in a month.